All I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Friends, today I am going to discuss the relationship between the mind and the body and the fundamental reason for those emotional disturbances that affect our physical well-being. Fortunately for us, we now have considerable knowledge of the subject. We know more about this thing called life than we used to. And in our discussion today, we're going to see if we cannot draw some conclusions that will help us to come into a better understanding of the creative energy which is within everyone. In the field of psychiatry and in the medical profession, things that a few years ago would have been thought ridiculous are now being accepted by most of us. We all wish to be well in order that we may be happy. But a prominent physician adds, we shall have to become happy if we wish to be well. There is a def definite relationship between health and happiness. And since happiness is a state of mind, there is a definite relationship between our mental states and our physical well-being. This relationship is called psychosomatics. And we must know its basic principle if we wish to help those whose business it is to help us to keep well physically. The word psychosomatics is taken from the Greek words psyche, meaning mind, and soma, meaning body. Therefore, psychosomatic medicine means establishing a right relationship between our thinking and our bodies. It is now accepted that many physical diseases are a direct or an indirect result of habitual thought patterns. This does not mean that one having a stomach ulcer was expecting to have it, but it might mean that a deep-seated sense of insecurity could actually produce such a condition. Of course, disease itself is not an illusion, but no doubt a much larger part of it than we have realized is a result of our thinking. And no one can straighten out our thinking for us but ourselves. A physician can tell us how we ought to think, but he cannot think for us. This thing called life is something that we have such an intimate relationship to that no outside person can interfere with it. What we want to discover are the few fundamental emotional states that have a wrong effect on our bodies. And we shall find that they really are very few in number although their effects are multiple. Our thinking will always have a direct relationship to our reactions to life, to what we are doing and to everything around us. It is interesting, isn't it, that we cannot escape living, we cannot escape this thing called life. And this thing called life really means God, the spirit within and around us. For instance, Carl Jung, who is one of the world's greatest psychiatrists, has said that faith and the belief in the reality of our own soul are the best possible mental hygiene. While another prominent psychiatrist has said that it is almost impossible to discover exactly where the emotional state leaves off and its corresponding physical condition begins. That body and mind are so interrelated that we can no longer separate them. This is the basis of psychosomatic medicine, or body-mind relationships. Karen Horney, who is one of the leaders in this field, has said that at the core of every ordinary neurosis, which accounts for a large percent of wrong body-mind relationships, that at the core of every neurosis there are generally four things that must be taken into account. First of all, there is a sense of rejection. And next, a feeling of guilt. Third, there is a sense of insecurity. And fourth, a feeling of anxiety. The first is an emotional sense of not being wanted, not being needed and loved. And the next is an unconscious sense of guilt which is followed by a feeling of insecurity, of anxiety and uncertainty. 
Let us start with the first negative emotion, which is a feeling of rejection, of not being wanted and loved. And it leads us right back to our relationship with life and with people. We speak of certain persons as being antisocial, being moody, staying too much by themselves, not having the ability to enter into the game of life and play it with joy. Such people stay alone a great deal and brood over their unhappiness. They haven't yet discovered the, bas the basic relationship between themselves and the world in which they live. They lack faith and confidence in people, in life, and in themselves. This has a depressing effect on the whole body and is the cause of much physical fatigue and the slowing down of the whole bodily process. Now, of course, such people cannot go back over their lives and live them all over again, because that would be impossible. But they can do this. They can rethink their experience, and they can readjust their minds to the thought that people really do wish them well, that they are actually wanted and needed and loved. And the one who does this the best is the one with the deepest spiritual conviction. And by spiritual conviction, I mean the one who has the greatest faith in this thing called life, in God. There is nothing in the mind that hasn't been put there. And if we feel that life has rejected us, we should now reverse this process and begin to feel that we are one with it, that life really desires only that which is good for us. It wants us to be well and happy. This deep-seated conviction must be rooted in faith, and there is no substitute for faith. Psyche is the Greek word for mind and soma for body. But the Greeks also had another word, pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A, which means the spirit. It was that conviction that man is spirit, mind, and body, and that the three are interrelated, just as it says in the Bible that we are spirit, soul, and body. And this point must be carefully considered in dealing with body-mind relationships. It is only when we put the three together that we have a whole man. For every man is rooted in pure spirit, whether he knows it or not, or whether or not he believes it. If we wish to establish, then, the best relationship between the mind and the body, we have to begin by establishing the best relationship between the spirit and the mind. The mind has to get its patterns from somewhere, and all of our unconscious thought processes are really based on our relationship with the universe, with God. It is impossible for us to escape this. Now, if the sense of rejection is at the base of much physical trouble, then we must replace it with the sense of acceptance. We must come to feel that life needs us or it wouldn't have put us here. We have to have confidence in life. And this confidence is established through prayer and through meditation, through conscious communion with the spirit, all the art and all the wit, and all the science of man is useless without it. The very fact that we are alive is proof enough that we are rooted in that which is life, in God. And the sooner we recognize this, the better it will be for us. We overcome a sense of rejection by having confidence in life, by having faith in God, and by actually believing that God is within and around us, desiring our good. In such degree as we arrive at this, we shall find the sense of rejection slip away from the mind, and with it, the unconscious feeling of guilt that has been harbored like an enemy within the mind. This sense of guilt can easily produce physical stagnation. It devitalizes and depresses, and this affects the whole physical organism. Perhaps this is why Jesus often forgave people before he performed the healing miracle of love for love alone casts out fear. Here is an interesting comment I would like to make. I have never yet known a person 
who came completely to forgive himself and to establish a right relationship with God who did not at the same time forgive everyone else. You see, most of our criticism of others really comes from an unconscious rejection of the self. This fact is well established. If one were to meditate daily on the thought that God loves him, this thing called life needs him, and then include everyone else in this meditation, he would soon find himself setting up a right relationship with everyone else. Not only would his sense of guilt and rejection disappear, his condemnation of others would go with it. Now that we have covered the first two points, rejection and guilt, let us consider the next two, which are so fundamental to right body-mind relationships, insecurity and anxiety. It is believed that a feeling of insecurity affects the digestion and circulation can even produce ulcers and various other forms of internal disorders. Anxiety and strain can affect the whole circulatory system and even produce serious heart ailments. How important, then, that this should be relieved confidence and faith in life. How can we feel insecure if we have faith? The answer, answer is simple enough. We cannot. When faith in life is restored, the sense of insecurity withers and dies. And it is the unconscious feeling of insecurity that produces most of our anxieties. Those vague feelings that things are not right, that makes the future look dark and gloomy, and even robs the present of its happiness. Anxiety disappears when faith enters, just as light disappears when we bring it into the darkness and that light dissipates the darkness. But someone might say, now you are getting back to religion and we want to be so philosophical, so scientific, so strong and so self-reliant. Well, let me ask you this. Is it possible for a tree to flourish when its roots are destroyed? Just so... It is impossible for us to exist in happiness and wholeness unless we recognize that greater life in which we are rooted, that life that lives in all of us and finds individual expression through you and through me. It is impossible to have radiant physical health without right emotional balance. And it is equally impossible to have a right emotional balance without first establishing a spiritual equilibrium. It is not enough to say, we came from God, for this is too vague a statement. It should always be followed with the thought that we now live in God. It is not enough to say, there is one life and that life is God. For this thought is complete only when we add, God's life is my life now. Let us keep it as simple as this. For out of the many books written on the subject of psychosomatics, we gather but a few simple facts as we seek to establish the right relationship between the mind and the body. These facts are as fundamental as life itself. This is what they add up to. If you want to be well, you must be happy. If you want to be happy, you must have confidence. And if you want to be confident, you must have faith. And this faith must be so deep-rooted that nothing can shake it. But how can you have faith unless you have conviction? Therefore, there must be a fundamental conviction in a power greater than you are, and you must learn to have complete reliance on it. Now, the funny thing is, we all have exactly what we are looking for. It was put there by this thing called life. You and I have it. Everyone has it. We just haven't been using it, for there is a center in every man's mind that is rooted in pure spirit. So let us take time every day to learn to be at home in this center. It will be the best time we ever spend. And let us realize that life is for us and not against us. No matter how dreary the past may have been, 
the future can be bright with hope and the present a thing of joy. Life comes to us new and fresh every day. We are like children who have misspelled a lot of words and our slates are covered with errors. But let us be childlike and take our slates to the great teacher that it may be wiped clean of the past. For tomorrow will be a new day.